the darkness is bad, right? We have the evil empire. Everything dark. And that's a lie. So people with dark skin have been prejudiced against in our, in our world because we have this belief that there is something wrong with the dark. We have been taught that the darkness is a signal of the end of times. When darkness comes into your life, it's all over. That's a lie. The darkness is the beginning of everything. Let yourself consider that for a moment. When we begin as babies, we begin in the darkness of the womb. When sunset happens, that is the beginning of the day, not the end. How does this rearrange things in your mind if you begin to consider that? I've been taking this course by Alexander John Shia, who is talking about celebrating, sanctifying the seasons. And he's talking about how mystical Christianity of the first century met the Celtic world. And the Celtic world which I was surprised to learn was not just in Ireland and that area, it spread all over Europe, even into China. So it was a culture that was very widespread. And when mystical Christianity of the first century met the Celts, one of the things that they did, they were based on a lunar calendar, the mystical Christianity of that time. And they had the grace to say to the Celts, who didn't understand what they were talking about, they didn't understand their lunar metaphors because they had a calendar that was based on the sun. And they had the grace to say, tell us your stories. And as they told their stories, the Christians of that period were able to say, oh, we know that story. It's just a different metaphor. And so they began to tell the Christian story using the metaphors of the Celtic world. And it changed everything about how we have inherited Christianity. The Celtic world was very much based on the earth and the seasons and the sun. And so the Celtic world, the soul's world, begins at what's called Samhain. It's the, the feast that starts with October 30th is the end of the year. And then there are three days that they call the thin times. And during those thin times, you're able to communicate with your ancestors who are passing more freely through the veil. You're able to reflect on where you are and you're able to communicate with your future self, your descendants. That part has gotten lost in tales of ghosts from the past. But that's those three days and then the Feast of All Souls on the second the new year begins. And what we call Advent actually was designed to begin then and have a 40-day period leading up to the, the winter solstice. One of the things that makes this all confusing is calendars got changed. So the Julian calendar was being used when this system was set up it was designed not for biography of a birth. It wasn't because Jesus was born on December 25th and we're gonna celebrate that birthday every year. That wasn't what it was about. 
it was about the sun is being born again. It went along with the seasons. And then it had to get changed because with the Julian calendar, there weren't enough days in the calendar. And so it was starting to be December 25th would be somewhere, or the winter solstice would be somewhere in the summer. And so they had to make adjustments. And so the Gregorian calendar was established then. And oh, I think it was like 1500, 1600, something like that. At any rate, there was a shift. So when that shift happened, now the winter solstice and Christmas no longer lined up. But that still worked because it, solstice means sol is sun, stis, it means still. And so it was the time when the sun stood still. And that, so you think about Stonehenge and what was the purpose of that, and you can see the shadows beginning to change. So Christmas still is the birth of the Christ, but the Christ or the Messiah, I think is how they say it, but the idea is that there's breath in it, the word that we say, Messiah. But it's a word with breath because it means the breath, the sacred breath of the cosmos found everywhere, not suddenly found 200 years ago in a stable. It's the sacred breath that infuses and creates all that is. And so in the Celtic world, this is going around through the seasons. So it begins in the dark at Samhain, and it goes through. And when it reaches the point of the winter solstice, this, the king and the queen of the dark in Celtic lore are birthing the light, the sacred light. And then it goes through the seasons and all the other festivals until it comes to the summer solstice when the king and the queen of the light birth the sacred dark. Equally holy as the light. Now, you might ask, well, how did we lose that? Doesn't it? Doesn't it just seem like common sense that we would recognize that the dark is sacred? Think about it this time of year when there's more dark. Don't you like to just curl up at home? Doesn't it feel good to rest? The fact that we don't is our illness. <laughs> it isn't about what is there in the season. When you're out under a night sky, isn't it beautiful? If you're privileged to have a baby growing in your womb, the fact that you can't see it is irrelevant. You can feel the life there. We all instinctively know that. In our gardens, we plant seeds in the dark. And they stay in the dark for a very long time. And there's something nourishing about that dark that allows them to grow. It's not like, oh, well, accidentally, sorry, we put you in the dark, but you still managed to grow. No, there's something in integral in the experience of being in the dark. What happened, though, is at the time of the Romans who, who kind of came on top of the Greek culture, and the Greek culture, at least toward the end, was very philosophical. And the, the Romans came in, and they were, they were actually a very brutal culture, slaughtering people, you know, pretty much at random, because they wanted to conquer and rule. And their society, the Greco-Roman society, 
was dualistic. And so they posed, everything was opposed. Man and woman were opposed. So you, he, you read things from that time and you can see that, that disparate way of thinking. The light and the dark were in opposition. And, we, and they were at war, and there are stories of the light and the dark being at war, and we're supposed to align with the light. And that continues through. So we think about Star Wars, and that, that whole saga that most of us love is about the light combating the dark. But that has terrible consequences. Because then we are set up to believe that some are evil, which is totally against unity teachings. There is nothing outside of us. When we look at our world and we see, we look at the political world and we see a lot of darkness, right, at this point in time, and we think that that's terrible and is it going to end? Well, let's talk about for a minute, the light, if the light is all good, then what about melanoma? Where does that come from? Too much exposure to the light. What about nuclear holocaust? Where does that come from? Too much light from the nuclear explosion. There is no one is all good and the other is all bad. Even good and bad, is that a reality? Instead, think about yin and yang. It, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. They both are together. You don't have one without the other. It's like saying your front is good, your back is bad. That, that doesn't make any sense. It's the wholeness of us. Now, this comes into, this is interesting. I find it very interesting. But in terms of spirituality, it is important when we think about how we see one another and how we see the situations in our lives. So, for example, we talk about it's a dark time in our lives when we're broke. Or it's a dark time in our lives when we have a great illness has come upon us. Or it's a dark time in our lives when we've gotten a divorce. Or it's a dark time in our lives when someone that we love has died. And if we think that the darkness is evil, then we are we are paralyzed in that darkness, and we don't know how to get out of it. But if we see that darkness as the beginning, the beginning of all life, all possibility, the womb of the night, if we see it as that, then there's tremendous hope. Anything could be born in that. The darkness births the light, just as the light births the darkness. That's the cycle. And so as we rest in that uncomfortable place that we call the darkness, we can hold the knowing that there is a seed growing within that is coming into fruition. We can call that the Christ. We can call that the light. We can call that the Messiah. Whatever we call it, it brings us hope. Instead of dwelling on what's wrong with our world or our lives, we dwell on what could be. Just like when you're holding a baby in your womb, 
hopefully you're not dwelling on what could go wrong, even though things can go wrong. You are dwelling on the goodness that is coming. Let yourself just consider for a moment where right now are you in this process? We don't actually walk in lockstep with the seasons. So you may be in a place of birthing in your life or maturing in your life, something beautiful. You may be harvesting in your life. But there may be an aspect that is in the darkness. And as you hold that, instead of feeling sorry for yourself, which everyone's entitled to some time on the pity pot, but just instead of that for the moment, can you hold it in a place, the womb of the night, and tell yourself that something so beautiful is coming for this, from this? Can you bring love to this? Whatever it may be. Another, something else that I learned in this class that I found so fascinating, again, with the Celtic world meets mystical Christianity of the first century, is the whole idea of Santa Claus and where this comes from, much richer than I knew. So the green man in the Celtic lore, the green man is the one that brings flourishing to the earth. And at the summer solstice, the green man leaves the earth and goes up to the north star, Polaris. And at the winter solstice, the task they believed at that time was to get the green man to come back, to bring life back to the earth. And in order to do that, they had a bonfire. And the bonfire had the sacred smoke because fire was the most important gift of the winter season. We needed, as humans, we needed the fire in order to make it through the winter. And so the smoke would entice the green man down into the fire to come back into the earth in order to make things grow. So when Santa comes down the chimney, if you were one of those kids that was worrying that he would get burned in the smoke, that's where it came from. The other part of it was a great saint of the first thousand years was Saint Nicholas. And Nicholas was a young boy on the coast of Turkey born of very wealthy um, parents who were tragically killed. And so he was left an orphan with a lot of money, and he became a priest, and soon after that, the bishop of Myra, and he died a pauper. And the reason that he died a pauper was because he was always giving, giving, giving. So the idea of, you know, the shoes that people put um, presence in the shoes, that was because at that time, if you did not have a dowry for your daughter, she would end up sold into slavery because you could not provide for her. And so when he would know that a young woman was coming of age and was at risk, he would take a bag of coins and put it in the shoe so that she would be saved from that fate. And he did that enough 
that by the end of his life, he had no money left, but he had helped his people. And this season is about generativity, bringing life back, and community. It's about generosity. So in more primitive times, when people didn't have all the conveniences that we have today, they needed to stand together in order to survive. So what we can take from that is the importance of community and the importance of looking out for one another. In this community, I don't know if all of you know that, but we have a system called UCount. Carol Fox, who is online, but not in the room today, she's the one that manages that. And the way that you, well, you could fill out a blue card and say, add me to you count if you have it, or you could put a message in the chat and Claire will make a note of it. Um, but if somebody has a need, they can put it out to everybody who's on you count. And not all of you are on you count. And some of you, it's because, oh, you never heard of it before. But now I'm telling you. So I would really encourage you, everybody should be on you count. This also means you have to sometimes check your email. So if you refuse to check your email, it's probably useless to get on you count. But unless you have a need, and then others can help you. And sometimes people have things to give away. You know, there have been tremendous bounty that has been given away in this community because somebody didn't need it anymore, and so they put out through you count, anybody want this? And somebody who needed it said yes. So this is the way that we as a community hold each other together. So those blue cards that I'm talking about are in the back pocket of your, cha your chair, if you don't know that. Um, and even if you, you have, you're getting the emails, it's how you get the email if you're not, but if, even if you're getting it, you can write to us with that and let us know to add you to you count. When you think about, we talk every week about we are a wild soul sanctuary. Think about, does this matter to you? Do you care? that there's a wild soul sanctuary in this town? Yes. Well, good, thank you. <laughs> Sylvia cares. <laughs> but if you care, then generosity is important. You know, don't think about when the basket comes around or, or when you're, you're texting donations or however you do it, automatic donations. Don't think about, all right, got to do it because I'm supposed to. Don't have that attitude. Think about what are we growing here? What has it meant to you to come to a place where you are safe to be yourself spiritually? Do you want that for others? Then give to that because it's only if we all pull together that we create something wonderful. This time of year is about generosity, not just getting by. Generosity and community create generativity. And that's what we're here to do. So it's great that you get Christmas presents for people. It's a fun tradition. But it goes deeper than that spiritually. That whole energy of Santa Claus is the energy of generosity. And it's something that we're meant to embody. We get past the point where we believe that there is actually a person coming down the chimney with a load of toys for us. And when we get past that, then we need to transition to the spiritual understanding that we are that. We are that, that are, have come to earth to be generous and help grow that which is most worthy of being grown. And we 
we do that in the dark. We do that at a time when it's hard to see. We even give money at a time when it's like, well, I don't know, that, that feels like a lot of money. Will I have enough? And we can't yet see because it's dark. But we know, we know through faith that yes, of course, because this generativity creates life. And so we will be okay. So darkness, the sacred dark, let it cover us like a blanket, the womb of the night. You've heard of the dark Madonna, the black Madonna. It used to be that all the Madonnas were dark, not because Mary was or wasn't dark, because they weren't images of Mary. They were images of the earth, the sacred dark. Even Adam and Eve. Have you heard of evening? The birth of life begins with the dark. And when you light candles, think of it as decorating the womb of God. Namaste. Namaste.